Uh, thank you everybody for coming. We are excited to talk about native plants. It's one of our favorite presentations. Um, I'm the Detroit Audubon Research Coordinator, um, Ava Landgraf. And here with me, I have uh, Noah, our office administrator, and I also have Michelle Sarian, uh, a plant, native plant expert. Um, we're very excited to have her here. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, if you could keep yourself muted, that way we don't have background noise. Um, and then turn your videos off just so um, people can focus on the presentation. Um, that would be great. If you have any questions, uh, please put those in the chat box. And I think that is everything. So we will we'll get started. Um, one moment. Um, so this is Native Plants for Birds by Detroit Audubon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And now I will pass the presentation over to Michelle to start us off. Hi everyone. Um, we wanted to do this presentation at this time of the year because this is actually a great time to put in perennials and native plant seed. Um, in the fall time, the soil is starting to cool off, but it's still fairly warm, so it's friable. You can get into it, put the plants in, and they get a chance to start growing before they go dormant for the winter. And then they're just kind of hanging out there for the winter. And since they're native Michigan plants, they're used to our extremes. And then when spring comes, they're already there and ready to go. Um, if you wait to plant until spring, then you're usually waiting till late April or into May putting the plants in, they don't get a chance to get their roots into the soil fully, and then summer hits and it's dry, and you have to water them extensively. So if you plant them in the fall, they've already got that head start, they're raring to go, um, and that's really how it is in nature for them as well. If you think about it, in the fall time and early winter, that's when they're dropping their seeds. Native plant seeds often go, have to go through a freeze-thaw cycle in order to germinate, so seedlings and seeds for our native perennials best in the fall. So we're gonna get rolling on that because we wanna talk about those plants you wanna put in this fall for those birds. So what exactly is a native plant? What makes something native? These are pictures from my old backyard in Roseville. And you'll see a nice abundance of native plants there, some spring and fall bloomers. But what makes something native is it's indigenous to an area. And here in North America, we usually make that prior to European settlement. So these are plants that are adapted to our climate, to our soils, to our moisture conditions. Um, but they're also plants that have co-evolved with the wildlife here in the area. So a bumblebee knows that it can go to a bottle gentian and push open those closed petals to get to the nectar and pollen inside and that bottle gentian will be pollinated by that bumblebee. But if it was some other flower, the bumblebee might not recognize it as well, or it may not have the pollen and nectar that that species needs. So native plants are really important for our wildlife because they have grown up together over time through evolutionary time and they supply each other's needs. So if you have um, wondering what things were native in your area, the Michigan Natural Features Inventory um, offers a site called Vegetation Circa 1800. And they got this information from land surveys that were done in the early 1800s before Michigan was heavily settled and agriculture and um, lumbering took over. And when they walked the land, they did it in mile squares and they noted down everything about the land that they could. And so MNFI went back into those records and reconstructed what each of our counties probably looked like in terms of the habitats that were here and the plant life that lived in those areas. So you can go to the site, look for your county, pull up your county, and it's a color-coded map. 
and then you can see what kind of habitat was probably in your area at one time and get an idea of the plants that were in that community. Now, can we duplicate that now? Probably not. I live in Detroit. Um, they stripped away all the topsoil. I'm living on cement and asphalt and fill. It's no longer Lake Plain Prairie, so I can't grow the same species here, but at least I know what was endemic to this area. And so I can try to grow some of them because they will be adapted to at least the climate. So this is a good place to start. One of the things that's come up lately too is that since native plants have become popular, um, some of the outlet stores have gotten into that, well, I can sell these different um, quote unquote native plants, but these are plants that are in the nursery trade that have been bred to show different characteristics. So you'll see at the top there, our native wild columbine is red with kind of a yellow and white center. But sometimes there are genetic mutations that cause some that are completely white. And that's pretty. And so the horticultural trade breeds them for that characteristic. But when that happens, sometimes genetically they lose other characteristics like really nutritious nectar or pollen perhaps. So the plant looks good and it's still the species, but it may have lost some of the characteristics that make it valuable for wildlife. The same thing with the butterfly weed you see below. In its case, not only is the pollen and nectar important, but also the chemicals that are in the leaves that make our monarch butterflies um, and their caterpillars less susceptible to being eaten. So milkweeds have a special community of insects that can use them because of the chemicals that are in their leaves, which they take into their bodies, which the cultivars may not have because it's been bred out of them. So it's really important to go at true natives. So um, unfortunately, about 80% of the plants that people in the U.S. use right now are non-native plants. Um, so that's a lot of our favorite species, uh, tulips and peonies, um, a lot of our roses, a lot of those classic flowers that we really like are unfortunately plants that are from um, usually Europe and Asia, and so they really don't benefit our local wildlife the same way that native plants would. Um, along with these uh, different flowers, we also use turf grass. And turf grass has, I think, probably close to zero ecological benefit. Um, it really is um, a practice that came over from Europe. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't help soak up stormwater. It doesn't help pollinators. Um, it's really not useful for the local wildlife. And so we're trying to encourage people to have less lawn area um, and a little bit more um, native plant areas. So we're, we'll go over some of the, um, some of our favorite plants, um, favorite native plants to use in our yards. Um, here are kind of some of the different areas that you will want to think about um, when planting. We have the overstory, the midstory, the understory, and the ground. Um, so this is good to think about like some of the larger trees that we can have such as oak trees and maple trees. Um, the native trees can be much more beneficial than um, a lot of the trees that are not native, such as maybe Bradford pear or ginkgo trees. Um, and then small trees and, shrub and shrubs, these are really important for um, some, some species that provide berries and others that do provide nectar for bugs. Um, the understory is where we have a lot of the perennial flowers. Um, that are really great for um, planting. And then on the ground is where we think about um, kind of recycling nutrients back into the soil. Um, so that's a lot of where the leaf litter is. That, um, with traditional gardening, usually we would clean up that leaf litter 
Um, but in order to have a more ecologically useful yard, we would leave that litter to recycle back into the soil um, and leave that available because there's many insects that use that leaf litter for um, either hibernating or laying their eggs to hatch in the spring. So we think about all these different levels when we're thinking about using one of our own spaces to create more habitat. Um, and habitat is the number one reason for bird population declines right now. Um, and so every little piece of habitat that we can create in our yards um, and in public spaces is really important and, and can really save bird species. Um, a lot of the birds that we're seeing, the largest population declines are the insectivore species that eat a lot of bugs. Um, and those bugs need native plants. So that is why we are focusing on native plants now. So when we talk about native plants, um, there's a couple different groups that we like to focus on. Um, we have the insects, berries and fruits, nectar, and nuts and seeds. So to start off, we are looking at insects insects and other bugs. So we have insects and then we have other things such as um, worms and spiders and all those little guys. Um, almost all baby songbirds need to eat insects um, when they grow up. When these birds grow up they might start eating more seeds um, but as babies um, most birds need those insects and they need them because they provide a lot of protein and they also have very specific nutrients um, that those baby birds need in order to grow strong bones and to grow their feathers nicely. Um, those insects and just a crazy number of insects are essential for those birds to grow up. So we have some numbers here about the amount of caterpillars that chickadees eat. Um, so that is just something to think about by having a, um, a native plant versus a non-native plant can be the difference between survival for a nest of chicks in your yard. Um, so we want to have plants that support our local insects in order to support our local birds. Um, and 90% of the insects that eat plants only eat the native plants that they co-evolved with. So these insects, a lot of our butterflies and caterpillars are host specific. So that is um, similar to how milkweed caterpillars have to eat milkweed in order to survive. Um, so not just any plant will do, they need a specific species of plant um, in order to grow. So a world without insects is a world without birds and those insects need native plants to survive. Um, so again, here we have this illustrated um, there was a study done about the number of species of caterpillars found on an oak tree and then found on a ginkgo tree in two yards right next to each other. Um, and the oak tree had 500, around 560 species of caterpillars, whereas the ginkgo tree, which is a, it's a very pretty ornamental tree um, over from Asia, and it's used in um, landscaping a lot, but those only had five species of caterpillars. So they're very pretty, but they do not su um, support our local insects and support birds. Um, so here's just a quick list of some of the best trees when we're talking about bugs. Um, these trees are the ones that support really large numbers of bugs. Um, our favorite is the oak tree. Um, and then there's some other um, very popular trees like willows and maples, um, a lot of um, berry trees like the crab apple and the blueberry. Um, so these are some numbers, some of the very best trees that you can plant for birds in your area. 
never will have to edit the. Uh, and then again, just to touch on, when these trees oh, have their nice. leaves fall to the oh. ground, it's really important to leave those leaves where they are, or I, in my family, we like to push the leaves under a bush um, so that it doesn't look too messy, but the leaves are still there for insects to lay their eggs and for birds like the tohi to dig around in those leaves and find little insects. Um, those are really important for the birds to eat in the fall and the winter. Um, so you don't have to leave all the leaves all over your yard, but um, please consider being mindful of where you put your leaves and maybe putting them in the corners of your yard instead of putting them in the trash. And that brings us to berries and fruit. And I will pass it back to Michelle to talk about some of our favorite plants for berries and fruit. All right. Well, like we mentioned earlier, it's best to plant in the fall and that goes for trees as well as perennial flowering plants. Um, service berry is one of our understory trees so it doesn't get very tall. It can fill in underneath larger trees and uh, tolerate partial shade. It's a very pretty tree in the spring with all those white flowers. Um, I think they look like popcorn in the spring because you can see it against all the bare branches all around it. Um, but you don't need to have tall trees in the yard to have service berry. You can use it as an ornamental tree all by itself. And then it will produce fruit in about June because it's also called Juneberry among all its many names. And these fruits look like tiny blueberries when they're ripe and they are delicious. But if you grow this in your yard, you probably won't get to taste too many of them because the birds go crazy for service berry. So you'll get thrushes, bluebirds, robins, um, many different birds eating the fruits from the tree. And then it's got beautiful fall color. It ranges from a light gold color through orange and red into a deep purple depending on how much sun or shade it's in. So not only is this plant good for birds, um, it's also very nice to have in your landscape because it's beautiful year round. And Ava, we can, yeah, there we go. All right, um, there are two species of elderberry that are typically available. One has red fruit, the other has black fruit. These plants tend to like areas that are a little more moist um, and the berries come ripe in the mid to late summer. Here you'll see a vireo eating the berries. I used to get catbirds um, nesting in and eating the berries from mine. These are very nutritious. And yes, they are the source of elderberry wine, so people like them too. This is a shrubby plant that dies back almost completely in the fall. So you won't have any foliage or stems sticking up typically in the fall. For the black elderberry, the red elderberry is a little woodier, so it, it does stay up a little longer but you can trim it back if you need to um, and encourage new growth from the base the next year. And my favorite, which is not everybody's favorite because yes, it is a weed. Um, it can get quite large, but pokeweed has these dark berries on those bright pink stems. It's fairly high in fat and very nutritious for migrating birds this time of year because this time of year is when it's flowering and producing fruit. Now the foliage and the fruit can be toxic, so it's not good to have around small children and um, pets that might get into it, and it can become a very large and dominating plant. You will also find it growing along the fence rows and any place you have places where birds sit, because the whole idea of a fruit is to have the seeds inside transported away from the parent plant. So they're yummy and they're attractive to animals, especially birds like this um, juvenile bluebird. And they will eat the fruit, uh, carry the seeds within them, and then excrete them out with a little package of fertilizer elsewhere. So often we see some of these plants growing along the edge of a fence. Um, I leave them just because I know how valuable they are to migratory birds at this time of the year. But this is a plant you have to love or um, not love. <laughs> and some people just don't, but I like to have it around. And it's a very pretty plant. Of course, we have some birds that require nectar like the hummingbird, but Orioles will also use nectar. 
And we know that hummingbirds like red flowers because they see in that part of the spectrum where insects do not. So we can go to the next slide there, Ava. Thank you. Yep, so the plants that you put in for nectar are not just for the birds. And hummingbirds don't have to have just red plants. So you'll see in the upper right there that ruby-throated hummingbird is using um, our native honeysuckle. We only have a few native honeysuckles available. Most of the honeysuckles that you will see in the um, horticultural industry are not native and they can become rampant and get into natural areas and become invasive species. So you have to be careful with the honeysuckle. Um, trumpet vine is another one that can get a little out of control though it is native. But hummingbirds will also go to white and pink and lavender colored flowers, even blue, as long as they have the right shape. So you need that deep tubular shape. And that's also good for hummingbird clear wing moths, some sphinx moths that are also like hummingbird clear wings and some of the large bees. This is one of my favorites that's just finishing up blooming now. Wild bergamot is in the mint family. Um, sometimes you'll see it called bee balm. And it's got a square stem and a slightly minty um, fragrance to the leaves. You can make tea out of it. But this is a great plant because each one of those uh, lavender things around the edge is a separate flower. So they have um, nectar and pollen available for our pollinators and nectar, of course, for our hummingbirds. Great blue lobelia is in the same family as cardinal flower. It's a more easygoing plant, so it's better for gardens. Cardinal flower can be kind of picky about where it grows. Great blue lobelia will grow in a wider variety of places. And it's got these lovely little lavender blue flowers, which hummingbirds will also use. And it's blooming this time of the year when they're migrating. So this is really important. Those little hummingbirds will need a lot of food to get to where they're going. Some of them will be crossing the Gulf of Mexico. So there's no food from Louisiana to the Yucatan Peninsula. So they'll need to get stocked up before they go. And this is a great plant for them to feast on. And then we have my favorite, which is blooming this time of the year. Spotted jewelweed is one of our few native annuals. Most of the plants that we've looked at are either woody plants or perennials. But jewelweed is an annual, so it has to come back from seed year after year. It has to grow in moist areas and the seeds have to stay moist, so you can't harvest the seeds and take them away and plant them someplace else. It doesn't work very well. Um, most often you will get this in soil that comes with other plants sometimes, and you'll see it popping up. It is a native impatiens, and the leaves are my favorite part of the plant, even though the flowers are pretty because the leaves have a chemical in them that's an anti-inflammatory. So if you take one leaf and roll it between your fingers and put it on poison ivy or a mosquito bite, um, it takes the inflammation down and it takes the itch away. So it's a great medicinal plant, but this time of the year it's blooming en masse. And um, when I was working at the nature centers in the area, I used to tell the students, this is a McDonald's for hummingbirds. They are highly attracted to this. They're all over it and they just love it. So if you have a chance to find some spotted jewelweed and plant it in a moist space in your yard, go for it. Though it will become kind of aggressive and sometimes shade out some other things because it does get quite tall. All right, this time of year is when a lot of people like to clean up their flowers. They like to deadhead them. And this is the time of year, it's critical for those birds that are getting ready for winter and migrating to get those seeds because they're high in fats that the birds need. So we're going to talk about things that we don't want to deadhead. So we're going to leave those seed heads up for the greater part of the winter. If you really want to clean up, I suggest that you do it later in the spring because the birds are going to need these seeds and the insects are going to use the stems and grasses to hide in for the winter and the birds know they're there so they will also seek out those insects during the winter and those insects need a place to overwinter like Ava said among leaf litter but also in plant stems so you want to leave those things up as long as you can. Some of the ones we're most familiar with as being seed sources for birds are the coneflowers and the black-eyed susans. 
they're all in the aster or daisy family or sunflower family, um, all the same group. And the central um, disc flowers will produce seeds that the birds like the goldfinches will go after fairly readily, but also our native sparrows, not the little house sparrows that we see around all the time, but our native sparrows will be migrating before too long and they will make use of those seeds as well. We also have some shrubs that produce uh, slightly bigger fruits. The American hazelnut is a lovely plant in the fall. It's got gorgeous fall color, um, produces fruit fairly readily. So the typical hazelnut. This is one that you will not get because at least in my backyard in Roseville, the squirrels used to get them long before I did. So I never got to eat them. So they're a great food source for larger birds like turkeys and grouse, um, but also squirrels and chipmunks. Some of our nut producing plants, trees take a little longer to grow, but they're worth the investment in the long run. So yeah, oak trees take a long time to get big and shade your house. Um, and it does take them longer to mature in order to produce seeds, but they're worth it because like Ava mentioned earlier, oaks are a host plant for many, many um, insect species, especially butterfly and moth species that produce those nutritious caterpillars in the spring and summer. And then later in the season, producing nuts for birds like this blue jay. And the blue jay won't eat them all at once. Blue jays will cache the acorns, uh, store them. And blue jays have a fantastic memory. So they will remember where they put them. Squirrels will not. Squirrels have little squirrel brains. Um, but the blue jays will also watch the squirrels and know where the squirrels put the acorns and go and retrieve them. So these are an important winter food source for them as they go through the winter, they'll remember where they stored them and go back and eat them through the winter. So yeah, invest in an oak tree. Lakota. These plants, of course, are also important for nesting in the spring and summer, but as we're coming into the later part of the year for winter shelter. So among the most important for winter shelter are the evergreens, of course, because they're not going to lose their leaves. Um, they're going to protect the birds from the wind and the cold and from predators. So even though we see arborvitae or white cedar often in the horticultural trade, we do have native white cedars. And so they're adapted to a range of conditions and the birds have that space then to hide in from the elements and from predators. Um, Trees like the hawthorn are good for nesting because they do have thorns and fruit available right there. So it's a good tree for protecting little nestlings. Now the most important thing as a gardener that we learn is right plant, right place. And what that means is you can really want to have a plant, but it may not be appropriate for your soil, light conditions, moisture, um, and other conditions that you have in your yard. So this was my backyard in Roseville when I used to live there. And I had the plants placed in different parts of the yard based on the light availability and the soil conditions where they were. Um, I really wanted to grow lupin, but lupin only grows in sand and gravel areas, very well-drained soils. So I actually made a special bed that was mostly sand and gravel and I grew lupin there but you can't grow things everywhere. So you can want a plant, but you have to make sure it has the right conditions to grow in. So we're gonna look at the different conditions and some of the plants that are appropriate to those conditions that we find in our yards. Goldenrods and asters are blooming this time of the year. They're important nectar sources for migratory butterflies, not just monarchs. There are other migratory butterflies as well. And there are asters and goldenrods for almost every condition imaginable. Sun or shade, dry or wet, um, underneath other plants and living in harmony with other plants or being big stands of colorful flowers all on their own. 
So you can find an aster or a goldenrod for almost any condition you have in your yard. And they're a really good place to start because they're blooming this time of the year and some of them will bloom all the way into October. And then they produce seeds. And even though the seeds are tiny, they're very good seeds for birds like juncos who will be here as our winter residents because they think this part of Michigan is south. So specific plants for full sun, and maybe you can flip to the next slide there, um, include things like coreopsis. There are several species that are readily available in the native plant trade. Tall coreopsis is tall, plains coreopsis is about mid height, and then there's also sand coreopsis, which is a much shorter plant. They produce these lovely yellow flowers through the early part of summer and into midsummer right now. But the best part about these are the seeds and the goldfinches are crazy about the seeds. I'm down here in Midtown, really close to Wayne State University. Not what you consider the best bird habitat in the world, but I have sand coreopsis in my backyard and growing on Wayne State's campus. And as soon as I turn my back on them right now because they're in seed, the goldfinches are all over them. So they will widely scatter the seed. You'll get lots more little baby plants and the goldfinches get a great meal. Another favorite are the members of the Silphium family, of which cup plant is the tallest. This plant has yellow daisy-like flowers, as do all the members of the Silphium group. Great nectar and pollinator plants um, blooming this time of the year. But cup plant is kind of special because the leaves clasp the stem, and this is where it gets its name, cup plant, because water will actually collect in that area and be there for insects and birds. So it serves many purposes. And then it has a hollow stem. So insects will be inside that stem in the winter time. And often chickadees will peck on the stems and get the insects out of the stems of cup plant as well. So not only flowering plants, the big showy ones produce seed, but grasses also flower. We don't think about it much because we don't see them. They're very tiny, they're wind pollinated, not insect pollinated. But they do produce a lot of seeds and they produce seeds right when our native seed eaters like our sparrows are migrating. So this is prairie drop seed. Um, it's a very nice ornamental looking plant. Um, you don't have to trim it at all. It doesn't form turf, but it does form little um, tussocks, little clumps. And then in the fall, it turns this pretty um, red gold color and it produces lots of tiny little seeds eaten by juncos and sparrows and other seed eating birds. So this is a nice small grass. Um, there are other ones like Indian grass and big blue stem that are much taller. So you can have lots of different sizes of very ornamental looking native grasses. All right, so shade is very challenging for plants because they need sunlight to do photosynthesis. But some of our plants have adapted to um, coming up in the early spring before the trees leaf out. And some of them can actually tolerate quite a bit of shade. So instead of planting hostas, we're gonna look at some native plants. One of the prettiest is the woodland phlox. So these are these lovely light lavender flowers that bloom in May. Um, sometimes into early June, and they will also produce seeds that the birds eat later in the year. And if you let them go long enough, they do form a really nice ground cover. Wild geranium. This is not the big red showy flower that we think of as geranium. This is the native geranium, also called cranesbill. A great in the early spring because it produces pollen and nectar when the bees are starting to come out of hibernation. Um, hummingbirds might also use it when they're migrating through at that time of the year. It's shade tolerant, but it's also tolerant of full sun. And even after it's done flowering, the foliage forms nice showy mounds. So it's a great all around plant and can become a nice ground cover underneath trees. Then of course, there's this red wild columbine um, blooming in May when the hummingbirds are migrating north. So a great nectar source for them. 
and it has kind of ferny foliage. The foliage will die back in the heat of summer, but if you trim it back, then the foliage often regrows this time of the year, so you get a nice mound of um, leaves again during the fall. There are also some semi-woody plants that can grow in the shade. This is bunchberry, and you may think that it looks a lot like a dogwood flower, and that's because it is a dogwood. It's a dogwood that grows on the ground. And it has white flowers in the summer, and then produces these lovely red berries in the late summer and early fall, which are a great food source for a lot of our migratory fruit eaters. And then if you have that low spot in your yard or you're interested in building a rain garden to catch the water from your downspouts and keep it from going into the storm drains, there are a lot of plants that are great for that. A hummingbird magnet, because of the bright red color, is the cardinal flower. This is a plant that's normally found on the edge of wetlands. It is kind of fussy in its habits, so you may buy it and plant it in an area that you think works out well for it and it doesn't do well. Keep trying, it'll eventually find its happy place. And when it does, it is a short-lived perennial, so it will only last a few years. But if it has more than one um, individual there, they can cross-pollinate and produce seeds and you might get some seedlings in the future years. So it's blooming from midsummer to right about now. We have it in our bioswales here on Wayne State's campus and it's doing beautifully. So hopefully we'll get more in the future if it goes to seed and it'll be there as the hummingbirds are migrating this time of the year. This is my favorite milkweed uh, rose milkweed or swamp milkweed, uh, Asclepius incarnata. The butterflies will use the flowers or nectar. This is, of course, a monarch host plant, so they'll lay their eggs on it and you'll find their caterpillars there, uh, as well as other species that rely on milkweed, such as milkweed bug and milkweed beetle. These are not insects the birds can eat, though. They take in the toxins that are in the milkweed, incorporate them into their bodies, and it makes them um, taste bad. So they wear these bright colors, black along with orange or red, to warn other organisms that they don't taste good. But it's still a great plant for um, other insects as well that the birds can eat, and the hummingbirds will use it as a nectar source. It is the milkweed that also will tolerate the widest variety of conditions, and it plays nice in the garden. Common milkweed, which is the one you see along the roadsides with the big balls of pink flowers. Great plant, monarchs love it, smells pretty, but it can be very aggressive, especially in a small garden. So if you need milkweed, go with the swamp milkweed or rose milkweed because it will um, tolerate being with other plants. It won't out compete them or crowd them out and it will tolerate a wide variety of conditions. Um, some woody plants that can tolerate moist soils. This is red twig dogwood. You can see the white flowers there in the late early summer. They do produce berries that the birds will eat. And then in the winter time, they have this bright red twig. So it provides winter interest for us. So it has nice spring flowers, summer fruits, summer into fall fruits, um, good fall foliage color, and then good winter interest. So an all around really great plant, though it can become a bit aggressive, but you can trim it way back and it will um, spring back up again. One of my favorites for wet areas is the button bush. They have these very unusual flowers that are pollinator magnets. So every insect that wants nectar and pollen will be all over it. Uh, they can be a little bit tricky to grow because they do need to have moist soil um, pretty much all the time. They can dry out a little in between time, but the droughts like we've had this summer, um, it would not be good for the button bush. You'd have to keep watering it in order to keep it going. But if you have it in a rain garden at the end of your downspout, that's usually pretty good for it. It doesn't get very tall, um, about six feet maximum. If it doesn't get enough water, it stays a little shorter. 
and then it'll bloom in the summer with these odd little ball-shaped flowers. And then, of course, if you've got clay soil or if you live in like northern Oakland County around here and you've got sand and gravel, there are plants that are specialists for those kinds of soils as well. Just finishing up blooming is the hoary vervain. It has a cousin, the blue vervain, that is good for moist soils, but this one is tolerant of very dry conditions. Um, I have it growing behind one of our buildings on campus where it gets full afternoon sun, is adjacent to an asphalt driveway, and the soil is sandy, and I don't water it. Once it's gotten established, it's in there for good. Um, the purple flowers attract a lot of butterflies and other pollinators, and then the small seeds can be eaten by birds later in the late summer and fall. A small shrub that is adapted to dry conditions is the New Jersey tea. And you'll look at this plant and you'll think, oh yeah, that's, that's kind of cool, but it won't attract birds. I remember hearing a story from one of the native plant growers. He had this growing in large sections in his nursery and it was always full of hummingbirds. And I couldn't figure out why because the hummingbirds couldn't use the flowers. They're not big long tubular flowers that a hummingbird could use. And what they discovered was a lot of small insects use this plant for pollen and nectar and the hummingbirds were eating the insects. Because yes, hummingbirds eat insects too. They don't just eat nectar. Nobody can live on sugar water alone. You have to have other sources of food if you're an animal. And so the hummingbirds were eating the small insects that were attracted to the New Jersey tea. So don't forget those kinds of things. Those little insects are good for birds as well. And this is one of my favorites. It's just finishing up blooming now. Uh, there are several species of blazing star or Leatris. Um, they have these bright pink cone shaped flowers and they are pretty much pollinator magnets. The other cool thing about them is when they're done, they will produce seeds that the goldfinches like to eat. They're pretty large seeds. And so the goldfinches will be all over these plants after they've gone to seed. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Ava. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so those are some of our favorite plants. Um, and just to go over again, some of the reasons why native plants are a really great investment. Um, again, we are running out of habitat for our birds. And so by planting native plants, you create more habitat um, and you build resilient bird populations by providing space um, where birds can feed their babies and refuel during migration and survive winter. Um, without those spaces, we are not going to have all of the birds that we have grown up with. Um, having native plants directly reduces greenhouse gas emissions because 5% of greenhouse gas emissions are from um, lawnmowers. And native plants store much more carbon than if you just had a lawn of bird grass. So there's several reasons why to invest in native plants, um, all reasons why they help the environment. And then on top of that, these plants are also really great for people as well. Um, green spaces are shown to increase physical health and mental health. Um, by using native plants, you will definitely save yourself time and money because these plants have adapted to the growing conditions in Michigan. Um, once they are established, they need very little to no care. Um, they don't need to be watered as regularly. They do not need to be, they do not require fertilizer. Um, so in the long run, they make much more sense, save you a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, growing plants and getting outside is a great way to, um, be outside and um, enjoy wildlife. And then also it can be a great way for um, the community to come together and get connected. Um, so 
definitely invest in native plants. If you have any questions, um, feel free to contact us and we'll go over some of the questions now um, that we have received in the chat. So Noah, could you come on and help us go through some of the questions? How's it going, Ava and everybody? Um, we only had a couple, but there's a couple more starting to come in. Uh, okay. So uh, these will be a little out of order, but um, That's fine. first one that might have been, that was, uh, looks like it may have been answered in the chat elsewhere was someone wanted clarification. Do native species um, originate here or can a native species be brought uh, like from uh, European uh, colonial periods. Yeah, um, Michelle, would you be okay answering that yep. question? Typically we consider native species plants that were here prior to European settlement. That means they may have come from other places many, many millennia before that, um, over the land bridges or brought by people that came to North America via the oceans but typically natives are considered prior to European settlement. Thank you. Um, I forgot this, I believe that was Julia asked that. Uh, Kathy would like to know, what kind of butterflies are those on the uh, hoary vervain? Oh, can we go back to that slide, Ava? Yeah, I think so. I believe they are either painted ladies or American ladies. Um, that is not their host plant. Um, painted ladies use pearly everlasting and pussy toes, which are also native plants for dry areas. Awesome. Uh, Zoe would like to know, is Lily of the Valley native? No, <laughs> unfortunately not. Lovely little plant, smells great. Um, and it can actually become an aggressive, invasive plant in some woodland areas. So if you have a back, suburban backyard and you wanna grow it, it's not such a big deal. Um, though my native plant friends might shoot me for that one because some of them are quite purists. But um, if you do live adjacent to a woodland area or a natural area, we do not suggest it because it can spread into that area. Okay, thank you. Um... This was actually a follow-up from before. So the question is, the American elm has mo been modified to resist Dutch elm disease. Is it still native? As far as I know, yes, because the modifications are usually from plants that have survived. And so they're considered potentially resistant to Dutch elm disease. And so we are practicing what's called artificial selection which is what we often do with things. We have a characteristic that we want to retain. Since these seem to have resistance to Dutch elm disease, they can keep breeding those plants and hopefully they'll grow, but they are still native American elms. Yes, unless they are crossed out with a non-native, which is something they've also been doing because there's more resistance from non-natives. So they still have some of the original genetic material from the native plants, but they're crossed out with non-natives, so they're not entirely native. But if we want elm trees, it may be the way we have to go just to make sure we still have elm trees. So jury's kind of out on that one. Sorry for the delay, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, is quince a native fruiting plant? Oh, that one I don't know offhand. I would have to look that up. I don't believe so. There may be a native variety, um, but I would have to check on that and get back with you. Uh, that was from Zoe as well. Um, somebody who's on their user, somebody with the last name uh, Jager wants to know, where do you get wild bergamot? Oh. There's a couple places you can check out. Um, my favorite in the area 
the closest one is pretty much um, the Lansing area. Wild type native plant nursery is one of the biggest in the area. Um, I don't know if Keep Growing Detroit grows wild bergamot, but they carry native plants. There's the vendor in Ann Arbor. I don't know if he's still operational, but that's native plants, um, Greg Wachlevic. He would usually sell in Cary Town Market. And um, there's a big, relatively new native plant nursery in the Kalamazoo area. So it's uh, a little more challenging to get native plants sometimes, but there are also a lot of garden groups in the area, the St. Clair Shores Yardeners, um, the North Oakland chapter of Wild Ones that host native plant sales in the spring typically. And you can often get those plants at those native plant sales. So keep your eyes open for those. Oh, and we do okay. have a uh, info sheet that we'll, we'll be mailing yep. out to ever or emailing out to everyone um, that lists a bunch of the plants that we went over today um, and then gives also a couple resources, a couple books, some websites, and some places, um, some nurseries where you can get plants. So we'll be sending that out. And Lynn just let us know that um, Troy Nature Center stage the Lloyd Stage Nature Center is hosting a native plant sale this coming weekend. Hey. So that also gets to one of the next questions, which was more about purchasing native plants. It looks like we have several places in the chat and described that uh, we can yeah. do that. And we have um, some other places coming up. Woldemar Nature Center in Lansing is having a native plant sale on September 12th. So there are definitely places in the area hosting those. Uh, do we know of any, another question in a similar vein, do we know of any landscapers in the area that support native plants or maybe work with them more specifically? Yes. And one of the places to check for information on that is the Wild Ones um, Native Landscapers. I think they've changed their name. But the Wild Ones are an organization that promotes native plants in the landscape and education about native plants. And they have a list in their newsletter typically of local people that grow um, and also do landscaping for native plants. Someone mentioned Drew Latham in Novi. So Drew's been around for a while. Um, there's a really great conference in March, usually the first weekend in March, the Sunday and Monday in Lansing. Um, the Wildflower Association of Michigan is a great place to learn about native plants. They have vendors there that you can get information about. They aren't selling anything at that time of the year because it's March. Um, but sometimes they have seed packets, lots of great workshops, and um, a, usually a phenomenal keynote speaker. So they're a good source as well. So the Wildflower Association of Michigan is a good resource, and uh, the Wild Ones are a good resource for learning about these things. Great, so a couple great resources there. and. Um as I forgot, but you said the name aloud, somebody was mentioned in the chat as working with them as well as uh, being a good landscaper to contact. Uh, Jocelyn wants to know, uh, are there any plants to be wary of that will take over too much space at a marshy location? <laughs> yes. Um, so there are native cattails. There are also non-native cattails. And Phragmites is that big plumy grass that you see along the sides of the roads, that is a non-native plant for the most part. There is a native strain, but the one that's taking over our wetland areas is non-native. And as Ava mentioned earlier, it's one of those plants that in its native territory has many species that use it. Here in North America, they've only found five insects that use that plant. So yes, there are things to be aware of. Um, also sometimes, you can plant a native plant in an area and it just gets happy and takes over. So you can get monkey flower that will grow barely in some areas and then you put it in other areas and it just goes nuts. So it, it's, it's different from area to area. But as someone mentioned obedient plant, which is not obedient. <laughs> <laughs> it does get uh, out of hand in some areas, but also it depends on how you mix it in with other plants. In our bioswale, we've got a lot of mature plants right now, and they've established themselves, and they've been there for three years. Now I added obedient plant. 
So it's got a lot of competition that will hopefully stay a little more in place. Um, Canada goldenrod is another one that can get out of hand and common milkweed. Thank you. Uh, before we go on, there was a re request to repeat the name of the native plant nurseries that you mentioned. Are there, uh, I, there are some that are mentioned in the chat. Are there ones that you mentioned uh, aloud only and aren't written in the chat? Um, I don't know. Uh, there are in the handout though. So yep. Ava, we're going to make that available, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it changes with time. Sometimes wild type was the biggest vendor for a while. Um, he's gone more to wholesale lately and has had limited hours this year because of the virus. Um, I don't know if native plants is still operational in Ann Arbor and keep growing Detroit has a limited selection of native plants here in the Detroit area. And you're welcome, Loretta. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. And, and uh, more info will be shared uh, after the end of the webinar too uh, about those things. Um, we have a question about uh, native chestnuts. If one had a choice between oak and a chestnut, what's best to plant? Uh, right now, probably oak. There are many different species that you can use in different areas for different soil types. Um, there are some diseases of oak that are becoming um, concerning right now, but for the most part, there really are no native chestnuts available. They got wiped out by chestnut blight pretty much. Um, it's really hard to actually get a true native chestnut anymore. And uh, to actually get it to grow and survive is pretty chancy. So they're trying to regrow chestnuts. They're working on it in um, terms of the genetics and the breeding because chestnuts used to pretty much cover the Eastern part of the United States, but they're still struggling with that. So in the meantime, go with an oak. And oaks support more insects than the chestnuts do. Awesome. Um... Uh, Ron asked, I'm pretty sure it was called Keep Growing. That's the name of the Detroit nursery, Keep correct? Growing Detroit. Yep. Okay, Keep, Keep Growing Detroit. Detroit is the name of the Detroit area nursery or the, uh, the city of Detroit nursery. Um, there was one I need to backtrack for. I think we are caught up with the most recent ones. Um, oh, there was Michelle, Michelle Jackson, if you're still here had a question, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, uh, so maybe I'm gonna unmute her for a moment if she's still here. Where, where did that name go? Hang on. Um, she had a question about uh, some trees that I think were probably on screen at the time that she asked it. So hopefully she can uh, clarify that with us. Michelle, are you still there? Oh, you know what? I can't unmute her. So, Michelle, if you're still here, you can unmute yourself and ask real quick or uh, uh, type it into the chat. And uh, she said that she was going to be building a bird space and had some questions about some trees. Okay. Um, in the meantime, Keep Growing Detroit is having a native plant webinar. Um, so you could you can go on to their website and uh, find that information and watch that webinar. Um, they're a really great resource for anybody interested in gardening um, who is in the Detroit area. Um, I did see another question here from Janice and yes, I just saw that. I, I, I missed that the first uh, on the first pass. Yeah. So thoughts on the use of bird feeders, harmful or not for the birds? Um, I think. I, I can handle that question. Um, um, most, I think a lot of people agree that bird feeders are um, mostly fine, mostly good for birds. Um, I think the only thing to watch for is keeping bird feeders clean and um, trying to make an effort that your bird feeders are supporting the native species instead of supporting um, the the non-native species like the house sparrows and the European starlings, um, those guys will eat a lot of food. 
Um, and they're pretty, they're just aggressive, um, opportunistic birds. And a lot of times when the house sparrow or European starling populations rise, um, they, they push back the other birds. Um, so the seeds you'll want to focus on, I like going with kind of like a smaller um, thistle seed, um, or actually called Niger. It's not actually thistle, but it's a little black seed um, that goldfinches like. And those are nice because they're, they're real small. And so the goldfinches, chickadees, like little birds like them. Um, but the starlings are not interested and even the house sparrows are not super interested. Um, or you can kind of go in the opposite direction and do like a larger sunflower seed. And those support um, kind of like the cardinals and the blue jays a little bit more. Um, the starlings and the sparrows will, will still eat them, but they're not, um, they don't seek them out as much. Um, if you're using like millet seed, a lot of the little like filler seeds, um, then you'll get a lot of the house sparrows and a lot of the starlings. Um, so yeah, just being mindful of what seeds you are providing, um, making sure that you don't have large windows that the birds are going to fly into where you have your feeders. You definitely want to be mindful of that. Um, and then just be mindful, make sure that you're cleaning your feeders um, so that you're not spreading any diseases between birds. Uh, in the area, we've had some of the finch eye syndrome um, so if you see a very sad looking um, house finch with kind of gunky crusted eyes, um, you'll want to remove your feeders um, and, and clean out those feeders, maybe leave them inside for a week and then put the feeders back out. And I think is that, are do we have any other questions? Um, a lot of, a lot of thanks to you guys for a great presentation. I think that is the last question. I didn't see any on Facebook. We only had a few people watching over there. Uh, well, you're very welcome, everybody. It's our pleasure. And a reminder in the chat to watch your Niger seeds for mold to be sure to check for that. Oh, the other gardening webinar coming up is um, Keep Growing Detroit. And they will, they can provide, they, they serve um, Detroit, Highland Park, and um, uh, Hamtramck residents with um, plants. And they, so like Michelle said, they have a selection of some of the nice native plants um, if, you're, if you're in the area that you can purchase from them. I think they might be giving out some free plants for Detroit residents as well. And that's keep growing Detroit. One more time. Well, hopefully you're all inspired now to plant native perennials for fall and keep an eye out for the birds. They're going to be coming through soon. Yes. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Um, Thank you so much to Michelle. We really, really appreciate all of your knowledge. I love this presentation because I get to learn a bunch from it too. Um, feel free, um, here's our email, staff at DetroitAudubon.org. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, talk to Michelle for you and get you any um, specific answers you might need. Or if you have basic questions, I'm happy to help out with um, picking out native plants or um, fixing problem windows. Um, remember to keep your cats inside, please. And uh, um, yeah, definitely email us with any questions. Thank you so much to everybody who donated or if you became a member recently. Um, we can only keep operating because of our um, chapter members and our donors. So thank you very much. And um, everybody have a good night. Bye-bye.